USGS. Uh, we are grateful for their support in this endeavor. I'm Lauren Barnes, uh, the Senior Fellow at the University of New Mexico, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar is Evaluation and Management of Post-Op Pelvic Pain, presented by Dr. Chip Buttrick. He's a urogynecologist at Kansas City that has a practice that specializes in pelvic pain disorders for over 30 years. He's a founding member and past president of the International Pelvic Pain Society. His area of special interest has always been the neuropath neuropathology of pain disorders, and he has authored many articles on the subject. He hopes he will enlighten you about what and why some patients will develop uh, chronic postoperative pain. Our panelists today also include Dr. Bruce Kahn, the director of the Minimally Invasive Gynecology Fellowship at the Scripps Clinic, and Dr. Barry Jarnigan, who's the medical director at the Center for Pelvic Health and, the associate and an associate professor at the University of Tennessee. The webinar will feature a presentation for 30 to 40 minutes, at which time we will present some clinical cases for discussion between panelists. We will open up the webinar for questions for the audience for the final 15 minutes or so. Um, just a few housekeeping items. In case anybody is watching here for the first time, I'd like to briefly review some of these items. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed. All participants will be on mute, but please use the Q&A feature um, on the Zoom webinar to ask any of the speaker questions instead of the chat feature. So use Q&A instead. Uh, we will try to address as many as we can within the hour. Um, and use the chat feature if you have any technical issues. The AUG staff will be monitoring that and can assist. At the end of the webinar, you will be prompted to complete a brief survey and provide feedback on the session. I also wanted to let everyone know that our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, May 26th, and it's titled Urinary Tract Fistulas by Dr. Sandeep Vasavada. Please visit the AUG's website to sign up. All right. And now, uh, Dr. Buttrick. All right, let's see if I can share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see my uh, slides. Do you see the title slide? Great. All right. Uh, so thank you very much for this nice uh, introduction. I'd like to thank uh, Augs and SGS, as well as Peter Rosenblatt for uh, allowing me to participate uh, in this presentation today. I want to also thank uh, the panelists today, uh, Barry and Bruce. Uh, again, uh, you will be a wonderful addition for today's talk on persistent post-operative pain. Uh, here are my disclosures. Important, uh, I am uh, for very brief going to discuss a little bit about a new way to take care of myofascial pain. Otherwise, you see my disclosures there as noted. Those others are really not relevant. Uh, I want to start off with just a very basic uh, presentation, a patient that we see on a regular basis uh, each and every day. Uh, Jane is a 36-year-old with constipation. She has this feeling that something is falling out of her vagina and the stool just has difficulty getting out of the rectum. She has urinary urgency but no leakage and she can't use tampons any longer. Uh, she described her symptoms got much worse after her second delivery and uh, she's done with children. And when you examine her, you see that she has a first degree uterine prolapse and she has a second degree rectocele. This is a very straightforward case. We do a vaginal hysterectomy and a posterior repair to correct the anatomic problems. But her post-operative course was different. You went in to see her the morning after surgery and she was having a lot more pain than most of your patients would describe. She had difficulty urinating, even though you really didn't do anything to the bladder. She had to be catheterized twice, spend an extra night in the hospital. Finally, the next day she does report she's able to empty her bladder okay and she was able to go home and her follow-up visits in your office seemed normal. But you saw the patient back six months later and this was just a follow-up visit, but she made two or three comments that was concerning. For some reason, she started to have bladder infections. and She's had two in the last six months since the surgery. She's still struggling with constipation, and she thought that you fixed that rectocele. 
She wonders if her bladder has fallen back down because she has the frequency and the pressure and she has difficulty passing urine just like she did before you did the surgery. But now the patient looks at you and says, I have pain with sex and I never had pain prior to the surgery. And she says to you, why do I have these problems? And what went wrong with the surgery? And that's not the kind of patient you want to see in your practice. And you have questions that you have to answer for these patients. So what this patient, of course, is describing is that she has a persistent post-operative pain problem. And this is a subject that in Eurogyne, we don't talk a lot about, but in other surgical specialties, the literature is filled with this problem. So again, I want to enlighten you on the fact that persistent post-operative pain is the second most common reason for a patient to go to a pain center. They don't go back to the surgeon. They go to a pain center. The chronic pelvic pain problems affect 15% of all women in the United States. And when we do surgery to try to help people with pelvic pain, that surgery oftentimes doesn't work very well. Remember, when we think of pelvic pain in a female, we think that surely it's their female organs, when in fact the evidence is quite strong that only 20% of the time is there a gynecologic etiology to chronic pelvic pain. And persistent postoperative pain is seen after hysterectomies, even when the original indication for the hysterectomy was not pain to begin with. Hysterectomy for chronic pain works 60, maybe 80% of the time, but that surgery will trigger new pain disorders in 5% of patients at least. At one year follow-up, non-surgical therapy versus surgical therapy is about equal for a patient with chronic pelvic pain. And hysterectomies, in fact, can worsen pelvic pain. And that is an important subject as we talk about our surgical interventions to help people with pain after surgery, such as mesh excision for patients who feel that their pain is coming from the mesh. We don't do a very, very good job with treating pain. And that's because I think a lot of us don't understand what pain really is. The other surgical specialties, again, mastectomy, yeah, persistent pain in 30 to 50%, breast augmentation, cholecystectomy, inguinal hernias, cabbages, 30 to 50%. Of course, because we're splitting the sternum, those patients will oftentimes, but total hip replacement, knee replacement surgery. And when we look at our surgeries, I'm sure a lot of you aren't aware that 4% of women that have C-sections have severe disabling pain, typically coming from that fan and steel incision that goes on years after a C-section. I've already mentioned about persistent pain after hysterectomies, and we all know about some of our patients having problems with pain after the slings we do. Retropubic slings may be less common than transobturator slings, and we're going to talk about that later. Sacred response minus vault suspensions, a lot of chronic pain after that procedure, and of course, a posterior repair. And uh, Weber nicely describes, especially with levator plasties, will cause pain in up to 25% of patients. And of course, the Cochrane view that nicely demonstrates 19% is the incidence of de novo dyspareunia when we do pelvic floor reconstructions transvaginally, whether it involves mesh, or native tissue repair. So we trigger pain. And so why do our surgeries sometimes trigger pain? Well, it's surgical wounding. When we do surgery on people, there's a physical trauma to the tissues, but also an emotional trauma, anxiety and stress and disruption in their day-to-day -day activity. And certainly the surgical site is insulted by the surgery and there's an inflammatory response and the sensory nerves get turned on and we refer to that as peripheral sensitization. But those pain fibers travel into the spinal cord, especially into the dorsal horn, and that's where the pain is actually processed. That's where it's modulated by our downward firing pathways that are trying to control or modulate the pain. That's, of course, why some people go through a surgery and they might have severe pain afterwards, 
and other people don't, is in that first 24 hours, the ability to modulate the pain varies from one patient to the next. But when the surgical site heals, those pain impulses are supposed to turn off and those impulses to the dorsal horn decrease and the dorsal horn or the central sensitization that occurs normally turns off. It goes away most of the time, but not always. In the peripheral tissues, there is a neurochemical soup of inflammatory mediators, receptors that are getting up, up regulated, and the nerve endings themselves are sending signals on up to the spinal cord. And that, of course, as I said, is where we process our pain. The spinal cord is the site of what we refer to as neuronal plasticity, meaning that those impulses can change what is going on in our processing of impulses coming into the spinal cord, as well as the modulatory pathways coming down from the upper centers. The barrage of nociceptive or painful stimuli hitting the dorsal horn changes the amount amount of glutamate that's released or substance P, NMDA receptor activation occurs. And there's a decrease in the threshold or the amount of pain necessary for it to be interpreted as being painful. Many of you know the term, but I emphasize the term allodynia. Things that shouldn't hurt will start hurting if we have this windup phenomena that is occurring. This expansion of receptive fields means the pain is originally localized, but now it's in the vagina, it's in the lower abdomen, it's in my low back, and it's going down my thighs. They're all producing pain with the expansion of receptive fields. And when this process of windup is occurring, that is referred to as centralization. And when that occurs, the spinal cord itself, the dorsal horn feeding back into the or the posterior horn results in exaggerated reflex output. And that sends signals back out to the periphery that maintains the upregulation in the peripheral tissues and triggers other problems like muscle spasticity. This data is straightforward and has been understood for 20 years. All pain that goes on for a long time has this tendency of spinal windup, and this is not desirable, okay? This just points out the neurochemical changes that are taking place within the dorsal horn. Key to this would be the glial cells. Glial cells are important because when we give people narcotics before surgery, you know, that pelvic pain that hurts so bad, I need something, doctor. Actually, the narcotics tend to activate glial cells. And multiple studies have shown that when you are using narcotics for chronic pain prior to doing surgery, that your central nervous system is already activated and hypersensitive. And that is a negative impact on what's going on in the dorsal horn as we're attempting to process the information that's coming from the surgical site. And we are trying to process the information first in the spinal cord and then extending on up into the CNS as we try to modulate this pain and control the processing within our spinal cord. So to summarize, any prolonged noxious stimuli, endometriosis, bad fibromyalgia, inner, uh, problems with vulvodynia, pain outside the pelvis, for example, arthritis in the knee or hip. This is pro prolonged noxious stimuli that's hitting the sacral dermatomes. And that results in dorsal horn upregulation and central sensitization is often dependent upon the patient's ability to modulate that response. This doesn't happen to everyone, but when it does happen, now there's sensory processing abnormalities. Things that shouldn't hurt start hurting and they the patient develops these neuropathic responses. Nerves are hypersensitive, muscles become spastic, and the patient now develops new pain generators.
They develop problems with urgency frequency. They have this feeling of pressure and heaviness, even though the prolapse is very mild. They might have bowel problems, difficulty passing stool, or just a constant burning in the vaginal area. But that's all pain that feeds back into the same dorsal horn. So even if we remove that endometriosis, even though we fix that pelvic organ prolapse, this process can still continue and thus it becomes self-perpetuating. This of course explains why that when we remove mesh, it does not often take care of the pain totally in many of our patients. This problem of muscles is oftentimes the key to identifying a patient who already has this upregulation and central sensitization. So just to review, why does one patient develop persistent pain after surgery and another patient doesn't? Well, some patients go through that surgical wounding. They develop the surgical site pain, their spinal cord up regulates for a few days, but they heal, they down regulate, there's resolution and it's a beautiful recovery. And 90%, maybe 80% of our patients do that. But there are known predispositions. There are complications that might happen during surgery that alters the amount of pain the patient might have afterwards. There's intraoperative errors. When I put in that sling a little bit too far lateral, or I wrap that suture around a nerve. And that's how the provider responds to the things that they see in their patients right after the surgery that might affect their response. So that peripheral sensitization, the central sensitization that's normal becomes persistent and that results in the persistent postoperative pain. So how we as providers can modify the patient's response to surgery becomes the key in us attempting to prevent persistent pain disorders and instead have a normal recovery. So how do we identify patients that might be at risk who we're gonna do surgery on? This is data, again, I emphasize, taken from other areas of surgical uh, care and what they know, because we don't do a lot of studies about this. So any patient with a prior, a prior history of chronic pain, and that's pain anywhere. History of existing, or excuse me, history of or existing persistent post-operative pain. Even a family history. Oh, my mother had a hysterectomy and it was never the same for her. Again, that's persistent post-operative pain. Any patient with a pre-existing centralized pain disorder is a big red flag. And that's, of course, fibromyalgia, interstitial cystitis, vulvodynia. But remember, 15% of the women that come to your office either have a history or have ongoing chronic pelvic pain, and 34% will have chronic pain, whether it be migraine headaches, arthritis, low back pain, et cetera. Studies have shown that the greater the amount of pain the patient has before you do surgery on her, the greater the likelihood she'll have persistent pain afterwards. And when you evaluate that patient, look for allodynia, the sign of a centralized pain disorder. Some of the other statistics include younger age, female patients, a family history of pain, psychologic contributions, anxiety, PTSD, bipolar depression, and look for catastrophizing. Oh, the prolapse is so bad, I can't even walk. But yet the prolapse is barely at the introitus, okay? Pelvic floor myalgia, again, is an important window to know how the spinal cord is working, looking for centralization or pelvic muscle dysfunction. And so what's the likelihood that we see that? Again, I have many of my Eurogyne colleagues that will say, oh, I don't take care of pain patients like you do, Buttrick. I don't see patients with pelvic floor myalgia. Well, the reality is, is Adams actually showed that 24% of all patients that come to a Eurogyne practice are find, found to have pelvic floor myalgia if you look for it. Metzer over at Barnes 
using a standardized exam shows that 85% of all patients that came to their practice, and that did include incontinence, prolapse, but it also included problems such as bladder infections, chronic pain, pain with intercourse, et cetera. Again, the population was slightly different, but 85% of her patients have pelvic floor myalgia. Again, the key, learn how to do the exam learn how to do the history, and you'll find that a lot of patients have pelvic floor dysfunction before you do surgery on them. So understanding how to identify those patients, obviously, I think are important. And we look for symptoms such as an achy pelvic discomfort, a feeling of pressure that they'll say like the baby's head is pushing and ready to fall out, even though I'm not pregnant. They'll have dyspareunia. The key symptom is pain, not only during, but after intercourse. Remember, if I do too many sit-ups, I hurt the next morning. And these patients will hurt after sex. Vaginal pain can be sharp or burning. Throbbing is common. And there's radiating pain. It radiates into the groin or into the low back or into her hip or buttocks. Abdominal tailbone pain, they'll describe suprapubic or pubic bone pain. The classic symptom is pain with sitting because we sit on our muscles. We sit on our tuberosities and our pubococcygeus muscle, remember, inserts onto the tuberosities. Look for urinary hesitancy, retention, and difficulty passing urine. And the key symptom, pain at the end of urination, not during but at the end of urination. These patients usually have, have urinary frequency and they also have urethral burning. That, of course, the old term for that, that was urethral syndrome, which we now know is nearly 100% caused by this hypertonic muscle dysfunction. And that's, of course, assuming you rule out other etiologies such as diverticuli, urethritis caused by chlamydia, et cetera. Obstructed defecation and nismus, and uh, these are all classic symptoms. Look for the symptom of tenismus. That's the patient that passes stool, yet then feels that she needs to have another bowel movement. 10 minutes later, she's in there pushing as hard as she can, but nothing comes out. And that's because her rectum is empty, but she feels pressure because her muscles are uncomfortable. And that's a real contributor to the development of prolapse. And then finally, the patient that is sent to you by your primary care doctor because she has this horrible prolapse that's so uncomfortable, she can't even sit in a chair, but yet she denies the symptom of bulge. Bulge, remember, is the primary symptom. And remember, our data would show that most patients don't even have awareness of prolapse until it reaches the introitus. So that's the patient with prolapse without bulge. Of course, we're urogynes. And what do we do? We do urodynamics on patients frequently before we do surgeries. And so here is a classic example. And this scale for urethral pressures are zero to 200. And I do urethral mammometry. I trained with Rick Smith, uh, Schmidt, a urologist, that said looking at the urethral is the best way to know what's going on with the pelvic floor. And a urethral pressure that's running 180, 190, 200, showing lots of up and down activity, of course, referred to as urethral instability. These are classic findings of someone with a hypertonic muscle disorder. And this patient will have problems urinating. This patient in this slide actually has a wonderful detrusor contraction there's a little bit of superimposed Valsalva going on. Look at that great detrusor contraction. But the bottom line is she passes a very slow, weak stream because she is functionally obstructed because she's having trouble getting her muscles to relax completely. So as a clinician, when you see these sort of things, this catastrophizing history and allodynia on your exam, you know, you, you do urodynamics and she calls 24 hours later with severe cramping pain after a very uncomplicated urodynamics testing. You see these ure elevated urethral pressures, a bladder diary with 
showing evidence of allodynia of the bladder. She's voiding every four ounces. That's not normal. And again, even a simple pelvic exam is uncomfortable for her. But of course, she tells you she's always had pain with pelvic exams, just like tampons are always uncomfortable. Yeah, these are patients that are upregulated. Experienced surgeons see these sort of things when they evaluate their patients, and they know that they're going to have trouble managing the pain after they have their surgeries done. And it's an important concept to not only recognize as the surgeon, but also to educate the patient about that they're at risk for having problems with pain after their surgery. Well, if the muscles are tight, what do you do? Well, physical therapy, the key being myofascial release. There's medications. We'll talk more about that in a second. Trigger points injection are wonderful. You can use local anesthetics. And I actually consider that a diagnostic tool as well as a therapeutic tool. I mentioned earlier my involvement. Sola therapy is the only FDA cleared device for the treatment of pelvic floor myalgia. It uses technology called photobiomodulation to help muscles relax. It's just that now we have a device the size of a tampon to help the muscles relax. It's been shown to improve blood supply and reduce C fibers. So it's good for pain that you want to turn off for patients up in the pelvic area. Again, randomized trials would still show physical therapy is a good point to start with. It does work quite nicely, but make note the success rate isn't 100%. Patients will still have pain. And the biggest problem with pelvic floor, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy is it's hard to maintain compliance. A compliance study was done that shows it runs about 20% six months after the completion of physical therapy. That's why I think drugs are important. Amitriptyline at night, tizanidine during the day. I use baclofen suppositories for the last 20 years. They work quite nicely with very few, if any, side effects. Uh, remember the Valium suppositories are commonly used by many clinicians, but there have been three randomized placebo-controlled trials that show it's no better than placebo. Uh, and then the neurolytic drugs, these are the stronger drugs, my favorite being pregabalin. But the key with these drugs is you got to get them up to the dosage that works. For example, Neurontin has been shown you got to get to 1,800 milligrams a day or it's unlikely to work. And many patients are just not able to tolerate that high of dose with these kind of drugs. And that's why we do other things like the trigger point injections and the other therapies. But let's come back to surgery. But what we don't want to do is someone that already is having problems with muscle pain is we don't want to do surgery that might contribute to that muscle pain, like a sacrospinous vault suspension. Or we might want to do in the past an elevate or a pro lift. And we might want to do a transobturator sling because she has stress incontinence or that posterior repair where we do a plication of the levator muscles. These kind of procedures are known to cause pain, especially if you deviate from the standard of care. For example, a transobturator sling is passed very close to the pubic rami. The farther medial or the farther lateral you go, Yes, you could reach the obturator canal, but more likely you'll simply be in the belly of the obturator internus muscles, and that will cause pain. So therefore, as you are developing a surgical plan for your patients with prolapse or incontinence, think about the amount of trauma that you're going to do. And certainly studies would show open procedures are worse as compared to laparoscopic or vaginal surgery. Vaginal surgery is least likely to cause persistent long-term pain compared to an open. And duration, as well as the type of the surgery. Again, the levator plastics, et cetera, we've already talked about. We all know about transobturator procedures resulting sometimes in groin pain. And I emphasize the nebulous groin pain after a transobturator procedure like a transobturator sling. 
I encourage you to simply Google obturator internus syndrome. The physical therapists know all about groin pain. It comes from the muscle. It isn't actually caused by the mesh. It's caused by the mesh potentially bothering the muscles, especially if the surgeon has placed the mesh too far lateral and therefore is going through the belly of the obturator internus muscles. Again, regional anesthesia repeatedly has been demonstrated to improve immediate postoperative pain, but there's also studies, especially in hysterectomy, that it seems to improve long-term persistent pain disorders. And then of course, if you do surgery, we will all have complications, hematomas, nerve entrapments, and we see those patients after surgery the next day in severe pain, or you get the phone call from the nurse. If we are appropriate providers of care, we need to jump on this exaggerated pain response that we hear about, not only resulting from our nerve entrapment or our hematoma, but also if the patient is just having this exaggerated response. We need to control that pain to try to downregulate or blunt the processes of neurochemical change that is happening both in the periphery as well as in the spinal cord. So as a surgeon, I educate the patient if they're at risk, downregulate the pain if it's present prior to surgery prevent new and increasing pre-existing centralization, block the barrage of noxious stimuli, regional anesthesia and other techniques I'll mention in a moment, and modify the patient's response to the trauma, especially if she's coming into you after surgery having problems. Jump on the pain component of the problem and get that under control quickly. I mentioned already avoid extensive surgeries, avoid the muscles, but there are perioperative pharmacologic therapies that have been shown to be beneficial and we want to use those. And again, patient education I think is key and teach them to keep their muscles relaxed. There has been multiple studies that look at drugs that you give in the pre-op holding area that might provide benefit. Clonidine, gabapentin, Lyrica, et cetera, to mention a few COX inhibitors many of us use. In fact, I think in, in my personal uh, practice, I feel that the pregabalin or Neurontin is very important. And I'm gonna show you data in a moment about the importance of ketamine intraoperatively. And ketamine has the most data looking at not only immediate postoperative pain, but as the subject is here, less persistent postoperative pain months after surgery with a very profound effect in some studies looking at that. Let's skip forward though. Let's suppose you're seeing a patient for a second opinion. Someone else did the surgery and she's having pain after her surgery. As you obtain a history, make sure you get a better understanding of the timing of the onset. If there were intraoperative complications, a suture around the pudendal nerve or, or a hematoma, again, those patients will present with pain typically in the recovery room. They'll present certainly in the first day or two after surgery. Infections like an abscess sometimes will be slightly delayed into maybe day four, five, or six. But when a patient has a very smooth recovery and then five days, maybe a few weeks after surgery, they start having problems of pressure and pain and urgency. They think they have a bladder infection, but the urine tests are negative. Yeah, those are all classic for them winding up their spinal cord and their muscles becoming tighter and tighter. Look for symptoms like pain with sitting and activity. Did the catheter bother you a lot immediately after the surgery? Again, these are patients that had allodynia of the urethra, therefore hypertonic muscles, prior to the surgery. Look for voiding dysfunction and trouble getting the stool out, even though the stool is soft. And a careful exam. Do a single digit exam. Yes, you're looking for masses, you're looking for neuropathies, et cetera, but look for localized pain versus diffuse pain. 
If they have diffuse pain, again, that's called allodynia, things that shouldn't hurt, hurt, then it's probably more than just that mesh arm that hurts. They have upregulated their spinal cord. You might need to take care of the mesh arm, but you also have to take care of this centralized upregulation. And early intervention is the key. I don't care what pain disorder you're talking about, low back pain, arthritis in the knees, migraine headaches, the longer you have pain, the harder it is to turn off that pain. You see the patient two weeks or certainly six weeks after surgery and she's struggling with pain problems, you want to turn off that pain and start interventions as soon as possible. As I said, the timing is key. These things we've already reviewed. If you don't know the Carnet test, this is an important uh, tool you want to add to your tool chest. Patients will point to their lower abdomen or that nebulous groin pain and say it hurts right here. We'll simply do an exam while the patient is relaxed on the exam table and assess how tender that is. And then have the patient either do a crunch by raising her neck and shoulders off the table, or she can lift her legs off the table. And then with your finger in the same location, in the same manner, rub or massage that same area that was tender, and then simply ask the patient, was it more tender, less tender, or the same? Because if the pain is coming from an internal organ, when your rectus muscles are tense, the internal organ manipulation caused by your finger will no longer occur and it will feel better in the sit-up position. But if the pain is coming from the abdominal wall, it will be either worse or the same in the sit-up position. And this test has at least a 90% sensitivity and specificity to this, a very simple test and you can always do a trigger point in that same spot, which also helps teach the patient where that pain's coming from. It's really not her ovary. It's not her colon. It's not her appendix. Oftentimes it's her muscles. Single digit exam is key. You're feeling the muscles as well as all aspects of the pelvis. You're looking for the base of the bladder. You're feeling the apex. You can reach up into the adnexa and sweep the cul-de-sac. Start practicing on just your routine gynecologic visits, assessing how well you can evaluate each of the organs using this gentle single digit exam. I always start though with asking the patient, can you show me your pelvic muscles? Muscle awareness is oftentimes lost when the muscles are tight. Allodynia, this is an important pearl I want to share with you. Vestibule that is diffusely hypersensitive or allodynic is suggestive of, valid, uh, of vulvodynia. This is an upregulation of the nerves at, throughout the introitus. When patients describe burning all the time, when I urinate, it gets worse. It's in my urethra. Ask them to show you where that burning is coming from. And if you find it and they identify the area above the urethral meatus, that is the referral source for the bladder. A UTI or interstitial cystitis will make people burn right in that location. And pelvic floor myalgia patients will tend to have primarily the greatest degree of allodynia at the six o'clock position. Use your finger gently with lubrication and assess allodynia. Then slide the finger into the vagina. You're evaluating the muscles. You're looking for tenderness. You're looking for top bands. You're looking for that obturator muscle. Again, that nebulous groin pain and figuring out, is it the mesh? Is it the arms? Is it diffuse tenderness? And just a couple words, mesh related pain patients, of course, are coming to you with a persistent postoperative pain. That means by definition, they have a centralized pain disorder that was triggered by surgery. Doesn't necessarily mean it was triggered by the mesh. 
It was triggered by the events that surrounded the placement of the mesh. And possibly it is the mesh. Possibly it was the mesh was placed in the wrong spot. Maybe she has an erosion and a chronic infection. There are things that will trigger mesh related pain. But when patients have pain for a long time, they develop this neurochemical abnormality and they also typically develop other pain generators. So if we are to take care of a patient with mesh related pain, our job like it is with every patient that has pain with or without mesh is to identify every pain generator using the techniques we've talked about, treat every pain generator, trigger point injections or diagnostic and therapeutic, resect a portion, not the entire mesh if you need to. Total resection is rarely indicated. And then when you do surgery to remove a patient's mesh for pain, use those perioperative interventions that we've talked about because you don't want to be triggering a worsening of their pain. While I realize this is a busy slide, the high points is er almost every study has a certain proportion of patients whose pain was made worse by the attempts to remove the sling. That's just further up, up regulation of their persistent postoperative pain. This is exactly what we would predict when we operate on patients with pain, whether it be a hysterectomy for chronic pelvic pain or removal of mesh, 21% worse here, 29 same or worse, 30% worse with the younger study. 8% worse with Danforth. Here's the best study looking at the comparison of, full, of total mesh removal versus just segmental mesh removal. And it showed no difference in their quality of life except for their mental status score on the SF12. The patient felt better emotionally because the mesh material was removed but their pain scores, their amount of pain, their ability to carry on normal activities were unchanged. Again, 14% worse. We don't do a good job simply taking people to the operating room and removing mesh. So downregulate their pain using the techniques that we've talked about. Regional anesthesia, and then give them some duramorph in that epidural afterwards. In the post-op holding area, give oral gabapentin, 600 milligrams an hour prior. Here's the data concerning a meta-analysis of 16 studies throughout the body preoperatively. The best data though would look at persistent post-operative pain, 17 randomized controlled trials, looking at follow-up three and six months later, showing that intraoperative ketamine is probably one of the best choices you can do to help your patient recover. So let's go back to our case that we presented, Jane Doe. Let's get a little better history. Turns out that her second delivery was a forceps delivery because it was a, a much bigger baby. And after that at forceps delivery, she couldn't sit for four weeks. Remember, that's a classic symptom of myofascial injury that occurred as a result of forceps. Remember, that happens 50% of the time uh, with forceps. Her falling out feeling and the problem she had with tampons being uncomfortable was due to her myofascial pain disorder. It wasn't due to the prolapse. She had obstructed defecation. Yes, she had a rectus heel, but she also had a non-relaxing pelvic floor. You simply didn't identify that prior to her surgery. And the surgery triggered a worsening of her pelvic floor dysfunction. The new dyspareunia, the voiding problem she had immediately after surgery, a classic finding. Yet now she is not excited about that surgery that you did. And it didn't happen. It didn't need to happen that way. So in summary, we need to start talking about the problem of persistent postoperative pain. Myself and my panelists, we see these patients on a regular basis. And as I said, they oftentimes don't go back to the surgeon that is doing the surgery. Obvious risk factors can be identified. So look for those risk factors. Be observant during your evaluation. Institute some simple things, including patient education, to modify the patient's response. And if you see early signs of that pain, 
jump on that and immediately turn it off as best you can. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I know that was a lot of information to cover uh, and I hope that you gain the passion that I have for this in your own practice so that you can help your patients not have the problems of persistent pain after surgery. Lauren? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Buttrick. That was wonderful. Let me switch over to my screen. And great. Can you see that? Yes, I see it. Fantastic. Let me... So I wanted to go to some clinical cases. Um, let's see. Um, as a reminder to anyone that's listening at home, please submit your questions to the panels in the Q&A sessions, um, and we'll try to address those after the panel discussion. I'm now going to present uh, two brief clinical cases and would appreciate input from the speaker and the two panelists on the evaluation and management of these patients. Um, so case number one, Karen is a 52-year-old G2P2. She has fibromyalgia, IBS, and stress urinary incontinence. She has no prolapse on exam, um, but did, she does have multiple areas of tenderness over her obturator internus muscle and levator ani muscles bilaterally. Um, so the questions are, would you offer this woman a mesh midurethral sling? And if so, what type? <laughs> Go for it, Bruce. What do you think? Um, I, I think, uh, thank you very much for having me join you today. I, I appreciate the opportunity, first of all. Um, you know, this patient, it's, I think it's, a, it's important what you said. Thank you, Chip. You did a great job again. Um, evaluating patients when they have come in for problems like stress and contact, it is important to evaluate them for pain problems. And I, a lot of times, will try to treat their pain first um, and try to see if we can help them with their pain first. Um, I think you, you illustrated quite well, if you do surgery on patients that already have some underlying pain, they're going to be at risk for increasing pain. So if you are going to uh, provide a sling surgery or any surgery to this patient for treatment of her incontinence, that would be important to document um, and talk with the patient about more importantly than just document. Um, but I, I think, you know, one thing I just want to add in there, you talked about trigger points. This patient might be an ideal candidate for um, a, a short series of pudendal nerve blocks to see if that might help her pain. And this is something, it's, it's kind of what you were talking about, trigger point injections, but to see if she could help with her pain, uh, again, prior to surgery, downregulate things a little bit. Um, I use these, you know, the same kind of pudendal nerve blocks we were taught as residents in, in labor and delivery. I have these, uh, the kits in my office. I'll do uh, lidocaine 1% with a little bit of triamcinolone, <laughs> one cc. I'm happy to share that with anyone else if they you know more details, but 10 cc's on each side. They get that, like you say, diagnostically, yeah, they feel better. It just numbs up that whole area all the way out to the introitus where the, the that transversalis muscle on the back. Um, I would probably, you know, I think if they have stress incontinence, again, did she meet the criteria? Does she have urethral junction hypermobility? Does she have cough stress test? Assuming she has all the other criteria, those are things. Yeah, I think surgery with a, a small mesh sling would make, make a lot of sense. I guess this is one other opportunity before I turn it over to someone else to say we just – uh, in American Journal of OBGYN, we just got accepted for publication. It, has, it is available online, but the um, three-year data uh, 522 trial using a single incision sling, the Solix sling, I'm sorry, in a brand name, but the single incision sling versus trans obturator sling, it was shown to be just as effective. Um, this wasn't powered to look at pain differences, but my opinion is, is I think long-term, we're going to see that the single incision slings are going to have a lot less uh, pain problems than say trans obturators learn slings and perhaps less problems with complications such as bladder perforation or hemorrhage compared to retropubic slings. So very good data that was just uh, published. You can get, you can read about it online. Um, so if I were going to do a sling for this patient, I, she would probably be a great candidate for a single incision sling. Interesting. <clears throat> I, would, I would echo everything that Bruce said. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank Chip for an excellent discussion. One of the things that, um, and I apologize for my voice, we have a lot of uh, crazy weather here where I'm at, but um, people have talked about getting away from routine uh, use of urodynamic studies. And this is somebody who, in my view, I would absolutely do urodynamic studies to do exactly what Chip showed in his slide. And that is look for that increased muscle activity with voiding, 
uh, look for things because this is the woman who's going to have a higher risk of having some retentive issues afterwards. I would also agree with Bruce. Uh, if I'm going to do a sling on this person, I would do a single incision. Um, and um, I also would agree with both that if you can get the pain under control first, before you do the sling, uh, you and the patient are going to be better off. Excellent. Uh, and, and I would add one other thing, just some statistics. So people with fibromyalgia, about 40% of those patients will have IC. Uh, that uh, bladder diary is important to look at. What kind of functional volume do they have to begin with? Remember, patients with IC and pelvic floor dysfunction tend to have this atypical kind of leakage. Patients will say, oh, yes, I lose urine with a cough or a sneeze. But ask him if they have this kind of weird dribbling of urine that just kind of comes out of nowhere. I didn't cough. I wasn't urgent. But I find my pad wet. And I kind of wonder where that's coming from. Uh, <clears throat> that's actually a, an inflamed, irritated bladder with hypertonic muscles. So the patient undergoes surgery to treat her, her stress incontinence. But she still has to wear a pad. You want to educate her that a typical urinary loss that you have is not going to get better with the sling. That's actually caused by this mm -hmm. pelvic floor muscle dysfunction and your IC. That's a different problem, which we need to treat. And as Bruce said, yeah, I would treat a lot of those things before we went to the operating room. Patient expectations, patient education before surgery in these yeah, high-risk patients. I was just going to say patient expectation is everything and making sure they understand that the sling will help with leaking when they laugh, sneeze, and cough, but they're likely to have a, other additional continued problems with their bladder that you'll have to continue to treat. Right. We do have a question from, um, from our Q&A. Someone, um, one of the anonymous, uh, asked if there was a concern for using a mini sling, given that the anchors are going to be passed through, um, you could potentially pass them through the adductus longus, uh, adductor longus tendon, and they actually typically implant in muscle themselves. And based on uh, doc what Dr. Buttrick's slides presented in sort of the locations where we do the surgeries, is there a higher risk for implanting one of these with anchors into this muscle body for continued ongoing pain as opposed to doing you know, a retrocubic sling? So without getting into commercial brands, when I'm doing a, and, and it should be said that patients who have pain can still have stress incontinence. So it's not, not fair to that patient not to treat their stress incontinence as well. But with that said, I typically in this particular patient use a single incision sling that does not have uh, the bullets on it. I, well, if I, I could just add, when you do the single incision sling, you know, it's the trans operator slings that have the higher incidence of, of, of groin pain, right? So that's going to happen when you're aiming laterally um, compared to a retropubic sling where you're going right behind the pubic bone. The, the um, single incision slings are basically, they are placed in the operator internus muscle, but they're kind of in between those areas. So you really shouldn't be going lateral. Um, and so you shouldn't, you should be decreasing risk for uh, development of groin pain. Uh, or any obturator nerve sensitivity um, compared with an obturator sling. And again, the idea might be that you're decreasing risk of uh, bladder injury perhaps or hematoma from getting those vessels retropubically. And Bruce, I think you're right on the money. And, and I want to emphasize, we all know where those slings are supposed to go, but certainly the three of us have seen patients who have had problems after surgery. And so often we find the sling going into a location that they aren't supposed to go. And that includes retropubic slings, where we all know it's behind the pubic ramus, but in cadaver studies, as well as when you look at dissections, when you do total mesh removal for suprapubic pain after a retropubic sling, we will find that mesh sometimes into the obturator muscles. It's like sometimes the provider is so worried about poking a hole in the bladder, they stay out too far lateral with that retropubic trocar and they'll catch the obturator muscle going up. And those patients usually are in the recovery room with groin pain. And you're thinking to yourself, boy, I didn't do an obturator sling. Why do they have groin pain? Yeah, you were just a little bit too far lateral and you got the muscle. Cadaver studies have shown that to be the case. Just like when we do 
mesh excisions for total mesh placement, we find the arms in the wrong spot, that's a big trigger for pain. I think you would agree with that, you guys? Yeah. yeah. Right. And I just want so this patient would not be a great candidate for a trans trader sling. I think we can all agree on that, right? If you were going to, yes. Right. Are there any perioperative <laughs> interventions that you would recommend sort of along the ERAS protocol, gabapentin, preoperative Tylenol, either IV or PO, PR, anything like that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, we that. use ERAS in all those type patients. Great. Um, we, yes, yeah, so for our, we uh, have a really good system for ERAS, which actually, if you aren't using ERAS at your, um, in your institution, um, they're one of our fellows uh, from a couple years ago, and I published an article, it's in OB, uh, Contemporary OBGYN, and in that article online, there are links to, from Scripps Health, which you can actually download and get, get order sets and a lot of information that Scripps agreed to share, basically how we're doing things at Scripps. So all our pelvic floor patients um, basically get an ERAS protocol, including oral um, acetaminophen, oral ibuprofen. And I want to just go back and talk about that IV acetaminophen. Um, another fellow of ours uh, recently just published, or it was a year ago or so, uh, a really good prospective randomized trial from laparoscopic hysterectomy looking at IV versus oral acetaminophen, and there was no difference. So a gram of oral Tylenol, four cents, is, is just as effective Forty dollars of IV stuff. Absolutely. In the Green Journal. I think you already kind of covered how you would manage or, or counsel her on her risk of pain going forward. So I think that's perfect. We'll move on to the next case and try to get that finished up. Let's see. Um, so Tanya is a 45-year-old. She has endometriosis, um, and she's one year post-op from a laparoscopic colpopexy and TLH. She presents to you for a second opinion. And unfortunately, she has uh, daily sharp pelvic pain, dyspareunia that is new, um, mostly new. It's worse than it was before. And she has severe pain with pelvic exams sort of everywhere. She tried NSAIDs, Tylenol, referred to physical therapy, but hasn't been um, and would, would like to know. And, and she comes to you and would like help. Um, what other elements of the history would you elicit in someone like this? Um, and kind of what questions do you need to know about her? Go for it, Barry. <clears throat> well, um, you always look at, you know, do they hurt, as Chip pointed out, do they hurt when they sit? Um, and what other things elicit their pain? Um, and uh, But really, truly, I mean, this is a patient who, unfortunately, I see pretty frequently that come in from St. Elsewhere, uh, who we, um, um, the exam is kind of the, tell all. Uh, and this is somebody who most likely has a lot of myalgia, muscle spasms, and, and an element of pudendal neuralgia um, that needs treated. This may have also flared up her IC, so a lot of bladder questions on bladder function and that sort of thing. Perfect. I'm just going to skip to kind of management because we're almost out of time, unfortunately. Um, are there any very specific things that you're going to be looking for with someone that's had a prior mesh surgery on their physical exam? Dr. Butcher did a really nice job in talking about where to look for the obturator internus as opposed to the levator plate. Um, is there anything specific that you would look for add to that, Dr. John of Inicom? So, I mean, again, it kind of gets back to Chip's uh, exam that he showed. Plus, um, in addition to examining the muscles, you need to go back and examine uh, in and around Alcox Canal. I suspect this patient would probably have some tenderness at Alcox Canal. Uh, currently, that's the um, mainstay, if you will, of diagnosing pudendal neuralgia. Uh, and so, and then, you know, typically you uh, examine in and around where the mesh would be to see if they have tender points there. Almost always in these patients, at least in, in, in the patients I mean that present like this, rarely have any issues with their mesh. It's always a flare up of their uh, muscles and nerves, uh, plus or minus their uh, bladder dysfunction. Uh, but you obviously want to examine those areas because number one, you want to assure her that the mesh is okay. And number two, quite frankly, if you don't evaluate all that uh, in the beginning, you're going to wish you had because if she takes somebody to court, you're gonna be asked uh, about where her tender points were and where her tender points weren't. So uh, part of that is uh, looking ahead to 
uh, medical legal issues. So let me just dovetail, if I may, right into that. So Chip talked really well about doing that single digit exam. I agree with that completely. The one caveat I'll add is, is you know, you probably do this, Chip, it just wasn't really clear. I always start with that single digit right at that, right at the posterior uh, fourchette at the yeah, transverse house muscle. I always start with just gently there to see if that's tender. And it's really interesting, that's helpful. If I end up doing a pudendal nerve block, which may be helpful for this patient, you do the block and then you start with that very gentle little uh, examination of that posterior fourchette where that transverse salus muscle, and, it, and when they realize that their pain's gone there, it really is enlightening to the patients quite a bit. Um, so from management perspective, can you use pudendal nerve blocks? Again, can you use treatments for IC, like bladder installations or other treatments for IC? I think those will be, you know, again, I, I think avoiding surgery, I agree with Chip, trying to avoid surgery. If there's not mesh exposure, if there's not a specific little piece of mesh that's tender um, that may have gotten involved with a nerve, um, I would probably avoid surgery. Perfect. If, 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 I, if I could add one thing, though, I don't want the uh, people listening get to get confused. When we do a pudendal block, Again, it can be a diagnostic tool because if it makes them feel better, then we know the pain is originating from that area. A pudental block is not how you diagnose pudental neuralgia caused by entrapment. And that's an important concept. Uh, there's many, th there's five criteria, non's criteria. That's how you diagnose pudental neuralgia caused by entrapment. When muscles are or hypertonic, it will entrap in Alcox canal, the pudendal nerve. And so when we do a pudendal block and they feel better, for example, it tells us that the nerve impulses that are carrying the pain signals are going through the pudendal nerve. Uh, many times I'll see patients where the patient felt better because the doctor did a pudendal uh, uh, block and therefore they must have pudendal neuralgia and the mesh or the stitch is wrapped around the nerve. That's not the case at all. That's not how we diagnose pudendal neuralgia. It simply means that we can make the muscles totally relax and if they still have pain, it's not coming through the pathway of the pudendal nerve. For example, a sacrospinous vault suspension has stitches near the vaginal cuff. If all of their pain is localized at the vaginal cuff and the pudendal nerve doesn't help, or the pudendal nerve block doesn't help, I would think more that the pain is localized from the apex and those nerve impulses are not coming up through the pudendal nerve. So again, think of nerve blocks that the anesthesia people do as a diagnostic tool. And that's how we're using the pudendal nerve in this contents, the pudendal nerve block in these one contents. Of the, one of the things I'd emphasize though is because everybody most likely was taught to do a speculum exam and then a bimanual exam. And what we're talking about is not using a speculum first, but doing a one digit exam first, because once you put that speculum in and you flare their pain, then it's very difficult to isolate it. So you really want to start out with that one digit exam first and foremost before you do anything else. Excellent point. Good job, Barry. We did have a, a one more question of, that's along the line of this. Uh, for patients that become somewhat dependent on pelvic floor injections and trigger point injections, the ones that come back every month for, you know, sometimes years, uh, what do you think about sort of managing those patients, trying to wean them off, or do you just continue giving it to them? And, uh, and kind of how do you manage ongoing pain that sometimes becomes dependent upon that intervention? I would usually say the patient's not on enough drugs. Uh, because uh, the drugs, again, are helpful for uh, myofascial pain disorders. Again, uh, the Lyrica, the Neurontin, the Amitriptyline, the Baclofen, and I would prefer to use drugs. Now, not everyone tolerates drugs, and therefore that is a problem. Uh, there is uh, very exciting data about dorsal root ganglion stimulation. 
Dorsal root ganglion stimulation has been used in pelvic pain patients over the last couple of years. There's two or three articles written on the subject. Uh, Google it. You can get some good references. I'm sure in any urban setting, you've got one or two pain doctors that are doing that kind of intervention, and that has helped those end-stage pelvic pain patients uh, in the long run. Uh, success rate runs 80-90%. Dorsal column stimulation does not seem to help these patients very much. Have any of you had sex, success with um, ketamine infusions like other pelvic or other pain conditions have been using, you know, sort of monthly, monthly infusions? Have any of you been referred patients for that or seen any benefit? I haven't referred anybody to, we have a program in the area here. Uh, I have not refer to anybody there. Um, although I would keep that as a tool in my toolbox. Um, I would echo a little bit of what Chip said. Uh, typically, if you're just doing injections, you're probably not adding enough other things along with it. Um, sometimes it's medication, sometimes it's pelvic floor PT, sometimes it's uh, um, uh, the um, like counseling uh, to help with their stress syndrome. Um, sometimes it's what you're injecting that matters. Um, I, you know, so, uh, so, you know, I, I do an allograft to the nerve and Botox to the muscle is what I call my Cadillac, uh, uh, treatment. And it, it seems to last longer. And then you chase those things with physical therapy or that sort of thing. Uh, and then add medication. It's so it's, it's the it's making a cake and you have to have a lot of ingredients in the cake to make it work. Excellent. Well, I, unfortunately, I think we're almost out of time. If we want to make just kind of short final comments and then we'll kind of wrap it up. So again, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's presentation. I, I think uh, my panelists did a great job and uh, I did leave my uh, email address on the title slide and uh, certainly feel free to contact me if you have any questions or problem patients. I'm uh, uh, more than willing to help out with uh, anything I can do to help you take care of patients. Perfect. Well, I just want to thank you, Dr. Buttrick, and for the wonderful presentation and for our panelists, Dr. Khan and Dr. Jarnigan, for a great discussion. Um, for thank you, we got to as many questions as we could today, and thank you for submitting those. Uh, I'd once once again like to thank Augs, SGS, and Sufu for putting uh, putting together these informative webinars during this unusual time. Uh, just a reminder: we're putting on these webinars every Tuesday for our FKMRS fellows and others that would like to join us. Um, the next webinar will be held on May 26 at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and we look forward to seeing you then. If you can't catch the live broadcast, then you can also watch the archived version of the Society at the Society's websites, or you can find it on YouTube if you search Augs Fellow Lectures. Um, we'll see you next time, and stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Enjoyed Thank you it. very much. Thank you.